I'm Maureen Ravenio. Whether you're here in person, watching through live streaming, or if you're joining us later via YouTube, it is my great pleasure to begin our time together with a brief introduction of our very distinguished guest, Dr. Bob Burke, which will then initiate the conversation between Bob and our perennial host and the founder of this series, Jamestown and the Jackson Center's own Greg Peterson. So let me first say a few words to get to know and appreciate Bob Burke. Educated at McGill, Harvard, and Empire State Universities, Dr. Burke's earliest work was in Cameroon, West Africa as project manager for the Canadian Aid Public Health Project, followed by seven years in family practice in Quebec, where he also served as an instructor of epidemiology at the University of Montreal Nursing School. His earlier years in Canada saw Tim achieve fame as captain of the McGill University football team and as a member of the varsity hockey team and as a Canadian all-star. Bob returned to the U.S. to serve as Chautauqua County Commissioner of Health from 1982 to 2006 and from then until the present as the MD consulting physician to the local city public health department. In that same time period, Dr. Burke became the founding partner of Family Health Medical Services, consisting of offices, four offices, serving 16,500 patients. In other professional capacities, Dr. Burke has been a photojournalist and author and has collaborated on numerous and varied medical publications. In endeavors both civic and fun, Bob was a founding member and has served as president of Chautauqua Rails to Trails and as race director for the Big Fish Triathlon, which over 10 years contributed over $120,000 to Camp Oniasa, located on Lake Chautauqua in DeWittville. Other philanthropic events include the Children's Love Fund Endowment and the Polar Plunge. Bob has participated in numerous marathon races as well, among them in Ottawa, Canada, and in the Cleveland Marine Corps and Buffalo races, and as an Ironman finisher at the Lake Placid Ironman. He will again be an Ironman competitor in Maryland in September of this year. Well, as you can see already, we are in for a fun time right now. So let's all relax and enjoy the kind of informative and insightful and fun conversation that is the hallmark of Greg's 18-year Turner Series interviews, as we now welcome Greg and Dr. Bob Burke. Thank you, Maureen. I'm really looking forward to this. Because the most important question from a guy that went to McGill is, were you a Maple Leafs fan or a Canadians fan? Be serious now. <laughs> I hate the Maple Leafs. There's a passionate dislike for the Maple Leafs of anybody born in Montreal. It comes from long-standing battles that we watched as children between the Maple Leafs and the Canadians. Um, my most memorable, oh, I have some memories being in the Montreal Forum. I mean, you, it, it's a hallowed, uh, well, the forum has moved, but the old building has in the pavement in front of it 26 brass plaques of 26 Stanley Cups embedded in the pavement with the name of the guy who scored the winning goal, and I can almost tell you all of them, and the year, and who the team captain was, and who they beat, of course. And a Maple Leafs, uh, you know. My son watched his first Stanley Cup final in 1993, which is the last time the Canadians won the Stanley Cup, and watched um, the Canadian goaltender at the time, 10 overtime playoff wins in a row. I mean, you know, this is stuff, and to this day, he's a diehard Canadian fan, though he lives in Oakville, Ontario, and has to deal with all the Maple Leafs fans there. So, does that answer your question? So, you were a, a, a hockey player, you had a football yeah. player, yeah. captain of the football team, so mm. you were a jack. I don't know. I, 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 I played football in high school, I played football in college, Actually, I played for the national championship the last year that I, I was in college. Uh, we could play all the way through. There were no scholarships. I played all the way through medical school. I still remember 
finishing class, going to practice, coming back, and everybody's in the library kind of hanging out like this. I've just had two hours of exercise. I'm ready to go. And that, my medical school life was really that kind of thing. And the last year we played for the national championship, uh, we lost in Toronto. And this makes it even worse, of course, <laughs> you understand, on a field that was kind of like it is outside today. And it was just a sheet of ice. And it was a horrible day. I still have bruises from landing on the frozen field. but. Yeah, it was a great experience, and I, I was a goaltender in hockey. I, I never played. I was the practice goaltender for the, the varsity team. I think they shot at me most of the time rather than tried to score just for fun. But the guy who played ahead of me had played for the junior Canadians. He was a dental student. He was the best skater and shooter on the ice as the goaltender, okay? I mean, this guy was phenomenal. And so I never had a chance to play. And so, but it was fun going to practice every night, you know, and getting so meal tickets. So you ticket. thought you were the next Gump Worsley? Not at all. Not at all. <laughs> I knew what I was. In, in, in hockey, I knew exactly what I was. I was a target out there that they shot the puck at. That's all, you know, in practice. So we're talking Jean Beliveau. We're talking Je Bernie Jeffrey. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, Yvonne Cornway. This is all your time period? I remember being in the Montreal Forum when Bernie Jeffrey on scored against Gump Worsley, who at the time was playing for the Rangers. He scored his 48th and 49th goals of the 50 goal year where he tied Morris Richard's record in the stadium. And Gump Worsley stopped him on a breakaway for the, you know, for the, and the place was electric. You couldn't, I mean, this was, do you realize you can't get a seat in the Montreal Forum? It's just, they're handed down. It, it, it's, it's religion. It's like the bills here, you know, the newspaper the next day has four or five pages. In the Montreal Star, it's like seven or eight pages analyzing everything to be a coach or something. It's brutal there. I mean, you know, people, it's religion. It's hockey is just another story there. We'll get to his medical career in just a second. Uh, <laughs> being, though, though playing football mm. and Canadian football, the Canadian Football League, it's the different. Grey Cup, all of those things, yeah. was Cookie Gilchrist part of your world? I, I remember Cookie very well, yes, yeah. yes. He used to beat my team, the Montreal Alouettes, regularly. He was a beast. The guy was just a beast. He played both fullback and he also played uh, defensive tackle or something. Uh, he played the whole game. You know, he was just a he was a tough guy. I mean, really, really tough and I guy. I think he even kicked field goals. Yes, he did. He did. He did everything. Yeah. Of course, came to the Bills in '63, '64, and they won the the AFL championship, and that's why he's near and dear to a guy my age. Is the, plus the name, and I did have a chance to interview. I was one of the few guys really? to actually interview Cookie Gilchrist, but we could go down this rabbit hole and never get out. <laughs> uh, so you're in Canada. You actually get your medical degree in, yeah. in, in Canada. Uh, Cameroon, of all places. Was that, were you assigned that? Or no, 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 no. That's a whole, I, that's funny. I, I was just, I, I've kind of been separated from college friends of mine for a lot of years and they've got a zoom that they've got together and I've hooked onto the zoom and I've just gotten back with these guys you know and one of my friends Jack who's a surgeon in in uh, Florida said to me I remember you leaving why did you leave and uh, he just asked me this last week and so I can tell you the answer really I was going to be an orthopedist and I was working with the orthopedist who worked I, I Gilles Tremblay who played for the Montreal Canadiens yeah, sure. I, I I was with Ted Percy, who was the orthopedist for the Canadians, the, the Montreal Alouettes, the, the uh, um, baseball team at the Expos at the time. So I got to meet all these guys because I was going to be an orthopedist and I was training with him. And I remember going to a, a, a seminar we did up on, uh, I, I, it was Montreal General, 10 East in a little room, a little smaller than this. And I just got very, very uncomfortable with the conversation. And it was just carpentry. I mean, you know, orthopedics at that time was not what it is now with all the robotics and the joints and everything. It was pretty, uh, you know, basic stuff. And I just, I got to take a year off. So I, I, I one night I was delivering babies, uh, you know, with, and I was talking to this mentor and he said, oh, my, my brother's the high commissioner to, uh, for Canadian government to Ghana. Um, why don't you talk to him about a job, CEDA, Canadian International Development Agency, much like USAID. So I got there and, I, and uh, some guy shows up while I'm in the, doing emergency work who's 
the guy working in Cameroon for CETA, and he says, hey, here's what the job looks like. Do you want? Meanwhile, I've got applications out to Thursday Island off the coast of Australia. I'm, I'm just going to go somewhere to kind of think about what I want to do the rest of my life. This seemed like a good idea. So I went there for three years. And what I learned was that I really liked public health. And I really liked the idea of having, a, I, I was looking after a million people at a dollar per person per year, which was our budget. And you had to be really creative about affecting the lives of that number of people. And it was all about immunization, sewage, water, uh, you know, very some maternal and child health, all of the things that, and I, I plus, you know, a city, I was born in Montreal, my dad was a pharmacist, uh, I, I didn't know the inside of a car, I knew you turned the key on and you drove, you know, and everything else. Well, I have seven vehicles there, uh, three Land Rovers, a big truck, uh, two Renaults, you know, like a Volkswagen bus, and these things were being put, you know, really to the test, and I realized the only way we're going to survive is if we maintain them. But I don't know anything about VM. But I knew that I had two drivers who were mechanics. So with a little money I squeezed out of the Canadian government, we built a pit and we maintained our vehicles. No vehicle breakdown mm -hmm. for three years. I mean, because we changed the oil, we did it. You know, the one vehicle breakdown we had was I had a World Health guy with me, and we were out traveling around, showing him, you know, what we were doing. And my driver forgot the spare tire, and we got a flat. <laughs> that was it. And I would go to the conferences of the, re I was the regional chief for the Northwest province of Cameroon. And we'd go to all, i go every three months to the meetings and I'd listen to the guys talk about they couldn't get any work done because their vehicles were all broken down. They didn't have tires, they didn't have this. And I realized I had a knack for kind of looking at this stuff and figuring out how to make it work from a public health point of view and making the whole system work anyway. So I got a World Health Scholarship because of that the work we did there. We had set up pharmacies. I mean, it was very, it was amazing stuff to do, you know. And all the hospital beds in our community were empty, no more whooping cough, no more measles, no polio, because we had teams out there vaccinating because our vehicles worked and we figured out ways to keep the vaccine safe. We, so I got a World Health Scholarship and I went to the School of Public Health in, in Boston, uh, where I got my master's in public health. That was how that all came about. So that's how I entered into public health. That's fascinating how this happens. Yeah. Yeah. And you also did some journal, uh, photojournalism along the way. Took a lot of photos. Took an awful lot of photos. And what I found, I, again, I, I, just before I left, someone gave me this Ashi Pentex 35 millimeter single, X re, a single uh, lens reflex camera. I'd never, I had had a brownie, I, you know, I had the kids. They, and I started to shoot pictures and I started to kind of you know, realize, and then I, when I was home, because I would come home every six months to interview people, to, because we were always hiring, whatever else, I brought back a dark room with me, a little, you know, and I had my, I had a little generator, and it ran my, you know, my little light, yeah. and I started to look at what I was doing and realize the mistakes I was making, and 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 started to to work on the craft of shooting these pictures and what I found was using ASA 32 or 24 Panatomic X, which is very, very high grained, but you need a lot of light, but you get these incredible photos that you could blow up and work. And black and white was much, I, I enjoyed it because it took away the distraction of the color. The color there was phenomenal, of course, but it, it's so amazing that it, it, it overwhelms you. The black and white is much more subtle, you know, and. And so I shot I had a couple of thousand, and I still have them, and I go through them, and that was, and so uh, two years ago I put together a, for, just for my kids and for friends, um, a book of photo and some verse that I wrote along sure. with them, because I can remember every picture I took, where I was, what it meant, why I did it. You know, it's one of those things, I don't know. So you get your tour duties done in Cameroon, you get the scholarship, you go to a place in Boston, also known as Harvard, yeah. uh, and then you go to Back to Quebec. Yeah, to a little town called uh, uh, Knowlton, Quebec, which is much like, oh, it, it's like where the rich and famous come for this summer, you know, uh, 
Uh, Donald Sutherland had a house there, and uh, there are people, it was the wealthy Scots, and, but there was a huge, I mean, this is an enclave. Uh, the Eastern Townships, as they're called, which is where this was, is an English enclave where uh, at the end of the Revolutionary War, um, this land was ceded to the Empire Loyalists, and so there was a fair English population there surrounded by this sea of French, and there were, I mean, it was majority of French speaking, and um, I had a friend from Cameroon, uh, one of my uh, fellows who worked with me, came and we set up this small practice, and um, spent seven years there, had a farm, had bees, and uh, all the things you shouldn't do if you don't know, you learn an awful lot about sheep and goats and chickens and everything else, uh, which everybody was doing, and it was fun, but um, it was just a good time, had kids, you know, I had three kids there, uh, uh, my fourth daughter was born here, but my, it's an interesting story, I, just the side, my sure. son was born six weeks before we left, and when he wanted to go to school, he decided he wanted to go to McGill. So we were looking at tuition and everything else, and he looked and said, if you were born in Canada, your tuition is such and such. I said, and then I said, if you were born in Quebec, uh, so I, I called someone, oh yeah, he was born in Quebec, he only lived here six weeks. He had uh, $600 a year, I think, we spent <laughs> on his tuition. Yeah, it was amazing, you know, the, the um, yeah, that was his story, yeah. So Knowlton, Quebec, and yeah. all of a sudden, Chautauqua County. Yeah, my wife's from, my wife, speaking of the Bills, yeah. when they built the stadium, yep. her street got cut off part way to build the stadium, okay? She's from Orchard, Orchard Park. Orchard Park, okay. Right, and I met her in Boston. She was doing, uh, she was teaching in uh, uh, Boston, and she was the friend, her, a classmate of the sister of a guy that I taught swimming with at a summer camp when I was uh, 17 or 18. And I had constantly gotten in contact with him and they kept trying to fix me up with her but I always had a girlfriend or something and then I was overseas. And so when I got to Boston, they fixed us up. And that's how we met. And so therefore there was a gravitational pull to come back to Western, or come to Western What Europe? happened was, uh, Quebec was trying to separate. You remember that story? Yeah, Pierre yeah, Trudeau. That, yes. Yeah. Well, it was, it, was, it was Rene Levesque, and they were trying to separate. And my wife, who was American, couldn't teach because she wasn't speaking French, and um, she wanted to teach. And she ran, was running a preschool, but she wanted to teach. And my partner decided he was moving to New Zealand. He didn't want, he, he just couldn't put up with the nonsense because all the signs had to be in French. And it was just a lot of pressure. And so suddenly I was faced with either running the practice by myself, two offices, um, and we were coming home for Christmas. So I saw this little ad, and it was a one-liner in the New England Journal of Medicine, Westfield Hospital, looking for a physician. Man, where's Westfield? She says, I don't know. We looked, and it was like <laughs> 60 miles or 50 miles south. So we were coming home for Christmas. So I called up. Mort Flexer was the uh, 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 administrator. He said, oh, yeah, come on down. Do you know what Western New York, especially along the lakeshore, looks like um, you know, when it's muddy and, and it didn't look so great, but as my wife said, you can't eat the scenery, you know, there's, uh, you know, you got work here, you could do it. And meanwhile, um, when I came to meet him, uh, the health commissioner had just died. And so he said, why don't you go up and see this guy, Joe Girassi, up at the county building? I said, that's fine, you know. I drive up and as we go up, we're gonna have lunch at Webb's or something. And this guy goes running by in a silver lame uh, track suit. And I, geez, there's a guy putting in some miles, you know. After lunch, you go up, it's Joe Girassi. Yeah. And so we're talking about running, you know, because I, I, I had just done the Ottawa Marathon and we were just chatting. And then um, one thing led to another and that was it. Uh, that, you know, my partner left. My wife and I are sitting in our garden. It's about April or May, and you can't give anything away if you're English speaking, you know, because it's like, you know. And she said, what's the worst? We'll stay here, you know, if we can't sell. And about two weeks later, someone came, bought my 80-acre farm, and some other people came and bought our practice. We gave it away, basically, bought it. We gave it away for what it was 
what was what we owed basically. I came here with uh, you know two dimes in my pocket basically, and uh, started working. So Nights is all 1982. Right, and the Lakewood water is growing out uh, Serratia Marcessians and Proteus, and, and and that's where Joe lives, and he's in my ear about the fact that the water in his hometown is like tainted and. What are we going to do about it? And I have to, you know, we, we, we had stuff right away. Uh, the taco hut business here with pe filling people's rear end full of gamma globulin because of hepatitis. It was a very exciting first year, I can tell you. It was really kind of busy, you know. I kind of forgot about yeah. that. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. There were some interesting things going on, no question. That was very interesting. So you're, you're really a baptism by fire. I mean, you become this okay. public health yeah. commissioner. You're the yeah, commissioner yeah, of yeah, health. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A guy and, from and, Quebec. And Joe says to me, you realize you are the most powerful person in this county. Those books you have there, the public health code, you have authority that you just can't believe. And I don't know what he's talking about. I mean, we're doing work. You know, we're doing the public health work. I'm not worried about that business. You know, and uh, we had a really good crew. I mean, really good people. Uh, and the work went on, you know. We just So then I decided I was not busy enough, so I would open a small practice. So I, would, uh, so I opened this little practice with a nurse and a, and a secretary. In Westfield? No, oh, in Mayville, oh, Mayville. In Mayville, 55 Elm Street. I rented someone's house and we did a little... I found the book about three weeks ago where people signed in the first day, you know, ah. welcoming a little book. I found it. And we were going through our library cleaning out stuff and there it was, yeah. And that... Uh, lasted about six months, and then I bought the old doc's house because the doctor in Mayville had died. That was the reason Ward had had um, uh, asked me to come down. And so I bought his house, and we renovated that, and I worked there for, again, just part-time, four, four afternoons or something like that, three, four hours at a time, for about five years all by myself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's grown pretty significant since then. 40, yeah, it has. Forty years later, you're... Yeah, we, we, we celebrated 40 years. Um, we have four partners, four offices, uh, 16,000, 17,000 patients, 100 employees. Yeah, it's a full-time, it's a big business. And my daughter joined me oh. a year and a half ago. What fun. Yeah, and now I gave her my partnership. She's, she's the partner. I'm just the working stiff now. I just show up and I work. I don't have to worry about things. I'm, you know, life is good. October 27th. Oh, don't bring that date up. That's, that's not a good thing. It is. No. Let me tell you why. Uh, not a good thing, no. In, this is an alert. On October 27, 1997, Robert Burke, County Health Commissioner, held a news conference to announce to the world that Chautauqua County had been home to a one-man HIV epidemic <clears throat> named Nushan Williams. Uh, Shaitik Johnson. You, he had 16 aliases. That Nushan was just one name. But the story goes back, it's, it's, it's a little, it, the story has a little more to it than that. Um, no, I know this is when you went public. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. But yeah. the story went back to, oh, about, I don't know, January, no, yeah, about, oh, I'm trying to remember. But it was a few months before that, we realized that we had an HIV positive in one of our clinics, a young girl. And then we had two, and then we had more. And then my staff started saying, hey, we got a problem here. And one of my, wasn't my staff, she actually worked for the state, but she worked for us as a field person for sexually transmitted disease, said, I think I know what we got here, and I think I know what's going on. You know, and I think I, I can identify this person. And there, were, there, were, there was a reason why she had interviewed him a while ago, and he basically said, look, I don't care what you say to me. When I'm out of here, I'm... I'll do what I want. And from some of the descriptions, even though the names were all changing and they were all and Marshall Johnson, he had about all kinds of names. Um, she had figured out it was him. And um, well, your your one of your nurses figured out it was. Well, they she wasn't our nurse. She was our, a state employee, okay, but she okay, worked okay. in our office. But then. We had to kind of, there was a lot of, the legal aspects were difficult because identifying someone as HIV positive was not, you know, something you could do legally. And the state got involved and then 
CDC got involved, and then and, and, and we had staff killing themselves. And it was very interesting, because again, this is command and control. You know, this is how you, you got to deal with these things. We had work to do. We had work every day, you know, to do, which was ongoing. But we also had a core group of people who could handle this while the work itself was being done by, you know, the people who we knew should just be doing that, that this was a little bigger than what they could handle. So we had a core group of people who just killed themselves, just worked day and night, day and night, you know, to, to get ready for what was the storm that was coming. What you're describing is the storm, you know. I can tell you. How difficult was it? You know, at some point, you're the guy. You mean you oh, are I the remember. guy in front of the cameras? But wait a minute. But wait a minute. Friday. So that's the 27th, 26th, 25th, 24th. Friday, 24th. First of all, I get a a, a call from the county, uh, the district attorney, who says, you know, you and I might be you know, might be facing some civil rights issues here with this cowboy we're dealing with. Nah, what are you supposed to do? Then I'm on a phone call at five o'clock in the afternoon Friday, and we're set to go Monday. And I've got the CDC and the state health department, and all I can describe the feeling is if, let's say from here to the door, I'm out on the end of the limb out there, and there's a guy here with a saw sawing away, because they're saying to me, you know, why don't you just, uh, you know, say do this or do that. You know, you, 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 this, this could give you problems. We can't do much with you. We can't even be part of this. And it was pretty lonely. And my staff, I mean, and we were all feeling like we had been, like, hung out to dry here, because we had, meanwhile, we had gone in front of now Judge Jurassic. Okay. About the fact that we had to announce this publicly, we had that we had a we had a problem here. We couldn't find the guy. This you know, and 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 we had the possibility that this could be much wide, more widespread than we thought. And he said, "You have to go public." And um, Sunday, I take my son to see the Buffalo Bills play the Denver Broncos in the stadium. Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting there, and the stadium holds, what, 80,000 people? Yeah. I had to leave at half time. I mean, I, I just couldn't stand it. I had this, like this, I knew what was happening the next morning that you brought up at 10.30 in the morning, and, uh, or 10 o'clock in the morning, and I, I just couldn't stand it. I mean, it, it was the weight of having that about to happen was just, not that it, it I, I just, Thought I needed a little space, you know. So the next morning we put together this, uh, you know, this whole press release written by Ann Abdella, who's put together all this. And it's in about, I don't know, 16 font, because I'm like you know, standing there, you know, getting ready to go. And of course I, I have the wrong, you know, it just, nothing went right, but it, the story got out. And um, I walk out. And the stringer from Erie, whatever channel it was, says to me, and we're thinking, hey, okay, let's go on. We, you know, we got this done. Let's, we're going. And he says, you don't know how big this is going to be. And I'm looking at him as if he's crazy. You know, like three hours later, Dan Rather's person is sitting this far. Raheem Alice is sitting there grilling me about the whole story. You know, who, what's his name? What's this? What that? You know, like, yeah, that's how it got. Absolutely absurd. It was crazy, absolutely crazy. I was sitting at home that night, finally got home about 10 o'clock at night, and the phone rings, and it's, I don't know, Hong Kong or something, you know, they want to enter, you know, it was, just, it was just going for, I don't know, 10 days like that. And then Nanny Gate happened. Was that? Nanny Gate. Remember Nanny Gate out on the coast? Out on, it was, uh, I forget, it was some story with a nanny and something out on, uh, you know, the, the blue bloods out on the, in, in. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. And they were all gone. Yeah. All gone. As if you were yesterday's laundry, you know, and that's it, done. They aren't, you know, the news cycle. The revelation of a name, the civil mm. liberties mm. question dealing with the district mm. attorney, and I'm mm. a little bit familiar with that, but uh, 
you had to kind of have uh, a court order to determine that Nushan Williams, alias all these mm -hmm. 16 other names, uh, was a public health risk. Right, and we got that from Judge Jirasi. I still remember, remember walking across the driveway with our attorney at the time who was eight and a half months pregnant, you know, and, we, and she was running along with me. It was very, very humorous, you know. Can you name the name or? No, I leave okay. that alone. That's okay. Anyway, um, anyway, uh, Judge Jirasi said, you got to do it. That's it. I want this announced. I want it in all that. Yeah, it's gone. You, you, this is something that has to be done. So, so you're, uh, Friday at least, you're armed with a court order. Right. And also the state health department lawyers had found a section in the public health code that gave us the right to do this. You know, a section in there that gave us, it, with, with, with the imminent danger that this posed, it gave us the right to do it. So now you have his name, aliases, it's out there. Picture mm -hmm. of him mm -hmm. is out there. Mm -hmm. Talk about the kind of the CSI part to actually get him arrested. I mean, ah, well, first of all, it turns out, I think about a few days later, um, I get a call from the sheriff, Joe, younger Jirasi. We got him. He's at Rikers Island. He's there on a some charge or something like that. So we got him. So we know at least he's off the uh, streets, okay? Um, ultimately, I got called to New York City, uh, I think it was Queens, to a grand jury. Uh, one of the girls that was positive was 13 years old and it was statutory rape. And mm -hmm. I think they went after him on that count. Yeah? So they, they went after him all day. Did he plead guilty? I forget. I don't think it. I don't think it went to jury. Jury did it. He got 13 years. I don't know how. I. I think he pled guilty to it. Uh, and then. Uh, well, then the story is even more interesting. He's up for parole, and I'm getting calls from the the state attorneys who are saying you may have to come and testify again. And our nurses find in. I don't know how they find. I mean, people. Inmate Magazine. Do you know that th there's such a thing as Inmate Magazine? Well, Inmate Magazine has him in there advertising that he's looking for young women and he's, been, he's coming out soon and he's been charged uh, erroneously for drug-related charges, whatever else. And that's all we needed. That gets popped up in court and he gets put away. Um, in a mental, a locked mental unit for the rest of his life. He's still there. I mean, oh, yeah, yeah, he's gone. He was in Danamora originally, and then he's now locked up somewhere for the rest of his life. Anyway, that's that story. You know, the, uh, the quick Wikipedia part of this is uh, New York State and local public health officials stated that Williams had sex with up to 47 women in Chautauqua County, 50 to 75 in New York City. And he went, went on in a news interview, the actual number was like up to 300. Uh, and obviously it was a cause celeb nationally for a period of time. Mm. So much so I remember my daughter who graduated from Jamestown High School mm. in 1960, excuse me, 1989, 1989. Mm. You know, the high school is now under siege you know, mm -hmm. the blackened, uh, they have this whole, uh, and, and there were a couple of, uh, of the uh, new Sean's quote girls were on, on their way to New York City to be on a, a, a television. Oh, yeah, 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 that, that yeah, yeah, that Montel had them on. Montel. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, that you. was, well, um, the whole thing was just unreal, you know, it was uh, 10, 12 days of just, no sleep, just, just, just a lot of things going on. We then spent a year working with the CDC and with, uh, uh, we had, uh, I think it was Akron University in, a, talking to our kids, finding out that um, there's a lot more going on in our schools at a younger age than you think and that we were really not addressing. So let's, let's go back a minute, okay? I come here, Chautauqua County has the third highest teen pregnancy rate in the state in 1982. 
There's a church on every street corner in every town here, okay? It's a highly religious, I mean, you know, community. Uh, and we have the highest, third highest teen pregnancy rate in the state. So we did a tremendous job over 10 years of dealing with sex education in the schools. All the schools had not only health education, but sex education in the schools, HIV education, and all this, and yet this happened. And what we found was there was a layer of folks who, risk takers who we weren't getting to. So we, there was a tremendous amount of work put in by our department to address this. And we had a huge uh, conference with the kids from all the schools. And <clears throat> basically the saying that came out of that, which was fascinating, was don't make decisions about us without us. We weren't engaging the kids in conversations about how to look after risk and whatever else. So we spent a lot of time working on this. And by the time he appeared, we had brought the teen pregnancy rate down to the state average, but the number of abortions was almost negligible. Originally, the, when I came here, 270 births, 280 abortions. We got to 240 births, in slightly older females, almost no abortions. So the pregnancies were wanted or were, you know, but so what we had done was gotten rid of fetal wastage. Uh, and we were working on, you know, we we're making them better, obviously better contraceptors, making better uh, decisions about life and, and also, um, but still there was this layer of kids, high risk takers who were, you know, out there that we had missed and so, that was a, 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 a bitter lesson for us to learn and something more work to do, that's all. You and Ann Abdella, who happens to be here tonight, yeah. uh, did a, a publication for the public health manager practice entitled exactly what you just said, yeah. don't yeah. make decisions about us without us. Mm -hmm. what, what was the message there? I mean, well, the message is if you're going to try and educate children about anything, you have to engage them and you have to help them be part of the decision-making process, especially in that, that age group. So they feel empowered about it and they also feel like they've contributed to um, the process. Just coming in and telling them, you know, two cops coming in from uh, in the D.A.R.E. program and talking about uh, drugs and alcohol for two days and walking out is, you have to have a, a much broader engagement that's built into a whole health education. Part of my early work with the late Bill Sharp, you remember Bill? I do. Yeah, Bill and, and I got involved in putting health education into all our schools, figuring out how to fund it and then getting all the schools involved. And then uh, there's Project No, which was in a couple of schools. We got it into most of the schools to have these kids start having conversations about um, human sexuality, but as in the context of health education, not just, you know, and the same thing with drugs and alcohol and everything else and HIV. And when the mandates in 88 came out for HIV education in the schools, we already had health education in the schools. It just blended in as part of more to do. So it was fascinating that that was going on. We just missed something with the high risk takers for this story. Uh, now that you've ruined my evening with this story, this brings out the willies in me, by the way, every, when I think about it. I, I get, it, 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 those were not fun times, you know, it was, it was a tough, a well, tough it, period. It, it, for, yes, and you were in the eye of that storm and there are many people who uh, reacted, I mean, there was a lot of emotion floating oh, around. Definitely. A lot of emotion. Definitely. I know Mayor Kimball, like he talked about, yeah. I interviewed him in, about that time. Yeah, that was he, tough. Uh, that was the political side. The other thing that uh, we, we involved at all in, the law had to change, or the law was kind yes. of changed as a result yes. of the case. It changed dramatically. I, I got called to Washington to testify uh, before a congressional committee because um, th there was this whole issue about, because there was another guy doing the same thing who actually got killed. He was, uh, he got shot in a car in Missouri somewhere, I think. Uh, doing exactly the same thing. And so there were changes with respect to um, the federally, with respect to the law. Um, and I, I... I'm just reading that New York passed a law that mandated doctors and laboratories to report the names of individuals who test positive for HIV. Reporting of partners to physicians is a voluntary. 
but doctors are mandated to report mm -hmm. the names of any known partners to the New York State Department mm -hmm. of Health. Partners may be notified without the permission of the patient, but the patient must be informed that right. their partners will right. be notified. Right, that was a change in the public health yeah. law, right. And it was attempted to do contact tracing. I mean, it was, it was good common sense. Uh, no attempt to, to, to be punitive for, you know, a lot of people became HIV positive for whatever reason. The trick was to try and get them to divulge the name of their contacts without then having to divulge to the contact where they got that information from in order to protect them and to begin treatment. And, uh, and now, with respect to the treatments, it's, it's remarkable what, what has happened uh, with respect to life expectancy of people who are HIV positive. So it was a good, it was a good idea, but yeah, those are, those are interesting times, yeah. Bill Sharp, you mentioned Bill. He was yeah, actually Billy. on my list of people to ask about. Oh, Billy was a good you, friend. You talk, talk about it. Bill, I got to know Bill very soon after I got here. Um, my health educator at the time said, you should meet this guy, you know. He's doing something in uh, the Jamestown School District. The teacher, and, he was a teacher here. Right? Oh, he was, he was the science coordinator for Jamestown Public Schools. So, so I went and talked to him, and he was doing something called, um, well, it became Growing Healthy, but it was the school health curriculum project or something at the time. And he had these teachers. He was teaching to teach public health. And so I started talking, I said, why don't we do this for all the schools in the county? So he and I dreamt up this project, but we had no money. And these, these materials were expensive and the training was expensive and to go to the school. So uh, Bill, who was like quite a character said, you know, I think I know where there's a source we can get some money. I said, what do you mean? He says, the DWI money. I said, what are you talking about? He said, well, 5% uh, of the DWI money has to go for education. And the sheriff, John Bentley, you remember John. Sure, John yeah, John was tough. He was buying police cars and he was doing this. And, I mean, John was doing what police do. We went before, and Bill was on the DWI committee. So we went and we made a proposal to the DWI committee for 5%, which was 75,000 bucks. Well, Bentley, he had a, he, he just quoted in the newspaper what the hell does brushing your teeth in kindergarten have to do with DWI? That was it. It was done. Gebby, 75,000. We got 75 from the, uh, the DWI people. We had 150,000. We started. Pretty soon we had $375,000. Wow. We funded all the teaching of all the teachers. We worked out a way so that we bought the materials the first year for the schools, and they just had to replenish using their state aid after that. Mm -hmm. And... Every school, school district uh, had health education, K through, K through seven, brushing your teeth, yes, because you start there and then, I remember being in the classroom, cutting open cow's eyes, showing kids how the lens worked, and, and you know, and we had people, and then you, then you, little family life education project, no, goes in there. And then HIV education comes in, you know, it was perfect, and that was Billy's, uh, yeah, oh, I miss him dearly. Billy took me on my first, um, for ski marathon uh, over uh, Tug Hill. Yeah, we did about 20 together, yes. Uh, and I remember with Bill, he was such an amazing guy. We were going to Ottawa to ski at the Keskinata, which is a big race up in, north of Ottawa. And we stop in this eh, restaurant bar and we're sitting there talking. And Bill immediately is engaging the, the bartender who is a geology, uh, and they're talking about the, the Laurentian and all the, the rock formation. Hey, yeah, Bill, that was Bill. You know, he was just totally amazing guy. Yeah, died way too early. Yeah. Uh, I remember him through, through school. Um, so you're, as the health commissioner, mm -hmm. you have a broad power. You have, mm -hmm. I mean, whether it's uh, determining lake activities, whether mm -hmm. it's determining the health of You can lake, close a beach. You beach, can close yeah. a restaurant. Yeah. You, oh, yeah, yeah. You can, uh, there are people who have communicable diseases that you can actually, you know, you can enforce certain things. Yeah, of course, the, the, the public health law is, very broad, and uh, of course, that's not what you want to do. You want to spend your time educating people, and as we've seen recently in this latest pandemic we've had, public health can become politicized and become very, very, very nasty for reasons that are, you know, very difficult to understand. And um, uh, unfortunately, 
you know, mandating certain things that people don't want to hear about or don't feel they should have to deal with is a tough part of public health. And the object always is to educate people so they understand why things are done, to protect them, and to, you know, anyway, it's, sorry about that. I love it. I know. It's good. Um, mm. So, you were, you know, had an interview uh, in 2021 um, where you said, that the whole COVID experience, which you've just, the subject you've, you've mm -hmm. gone into, was the most exasperating year of your career. And Lord knows, we just talked about New Sean Williams, mm. seeing how the pandemic has been mishandled. Yeah, it was terribly mishandled. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Go into specific about that. I mean, what well, at which level do you want to talk about? We can talk about nationally, uh, pretending that it wasn't going to happen here, not being prepared for it when it started to happen here, saying that it was gonna, you know, it was just on a ship, uh, our last president saying that it was just on a ship, you know, I, we had a couple of people, don't worry about it. It's gonna be over by Easter or whatever. It was. You know, we just kept, we just kept underplaying and we were woefully unprepared with respect to um, testing and, um, and it's just, the hospital system got completely overwhelmed. It almost broke. We were very, very close to just breaking. I mean, it was amazing. And then it got politicized. And um, people threatening public health officers, people not understand, and the messaging was not good. And CDC did a poor job in many ways in their messaging. And people not understanding that this was a, a vaccine that has been worked on for years and years, and it was initially worked on for Ebola, and a uh, novel technique uh, which really gave them the opportunity to get a vaccine to market within about eight or nine months, which was totally incredible, and yet couldn't <coughs> sell it. And then there's this whole anti-vaxxer process going on out there. I've seen what happens when you're not vaccinated. I've seen it at its worst. And people just don't understand it. And it's frustrating that you can't get that message out because we've lived so long where we really don't see much going on until this happened. We lost a million people here. And it's still going on at three, 400 a day. A million people. No other country in the world had this kind of mor morbidity and mortality. That's not a good process. And now we see what? Polio? Measles? Uh, it, it just doesn't make any sense. You know? Doesn't make any sense. These are things that should not be happening. And, uh, and that pandemic showed us in a sense, you know, that we were woefully un uh, unprepared and woefully uneducated when it came to people understanding the, the, you know, the, I remember being on the phone with people telling me, why aren't you giving this patient ivermectin? Why aren't you giving them chloroquine, you know, hydroxychloroquine? There's no proof, nothing, but the news or the, the, the um, social media is awash with, all kinds of information, misinformation, and we've done such, we've done a terrible job uh, getting people to understand or, or to have some media literacy, enough media literacy to understand what's garbage and what's, you know, uh, valid uh, information based on statistically uh, sound, um, you know, unbiased uh, to the best possible way. Uh, experiments or uh, um, uh, research, you know, uh, we, we've just failed at that. And how about you said, you know, you got the national media you're going on and you're right, it became incredibly politicized and then it leaks its way down to the local level, mm -hmm. you know, where you'd like to think the, the, the person, whether it was uh, you know, the county executive, I know PJ was so thrilled to have you mm -hmm. kind of back in, mm -hmm. taking leadership there. 
but like not, not having somebody listen to you. I mean, you're, you're short of a mandate, you can't be a czar, but. But again, you're dealing even, you know, you go into, we looked at the data sets we were getting of immunization levels in different parts of the county, and you can't believe it. I mean, I'm, I still work in the hospital occasionally, and I'm shipping people off intubated, dying, you know, dying within three, four days. And there are people who say, mm, no, you know, I, I, I don't want a blood transfusion if it's from someone who's had uh, COVID vaccine. You, this, you can't, how are you supposed to get around that kind of, you know, we have failed in our, our public health education. I, I don't know why. Um, I, I'm not sure what's gone wrong because for years we did a fairly good job educating people, even though it was a tough sell, you know, how, how long has it taken us to get cigarette smoking down to about 16% of the population? Uh, you know, uh, there's still young people dying of uh, alcoholism and uh, look at the number of overdose deaths, yeah. almost 100,000. Almost a hundred thousand. I mean, it, there's something we're we're just not getting the message out in a way that's ringing a bell. I mean, it's it just mm, tough. An example, and I don't know if it's, I can't say it's a small example, but it was certainly highly controversial for a short period of time. Is when the uh, health department talked about smoking in restaurants. Mm -hmm. And oh, I remember that. And yeah, that was a hot. Yeah, conversation and, definitely. And you had to deal with a, sort of the political, yeah, that aspect. Yeah, of it. oh, yeah. of course. It was um, that was brutal because everybody was saying these restaurants are going to go out of business, bars, you know. It's all, it didn't happen. Actually, they're busier than they, you know. Um, but that's a very powerful lobby, you know. There's a lot of money involved there. That's a, a really, really, really powerful lobby, and they did their best to sow the seeds of discontent about that, in spite of the fact that 470,000 Americans die every year from cigarette-related deaths, 170 from heart disease, 150 from lung cancer, and another 150 or so from emphysema. That seems to be, you know, that's just, well, you know, that's a choice they made, you know. Well. By statute, and I think it's New York State statute, I mean, you, once you're selected as the commissioner, you have rules that you're governed by, which are New York State rules, and yet uh, applied to Chautauqua County. Did you feel the county, Chautauqua County legislature, them kind of try to politicize the office? Did you ever feel that way? I never did because I understood, A, you know, it, it was interesting. I worked for Joe Girasi, then I worked for uh, John Glenzer, then I worked for... Andy Goodell, and then I worked for um, Mark Thomas, uh, and I worked for Edwards, you know, and, and PJ, you know. And except for one of them, I had no political interference at all. They said to me, look, you know what you're doing, please just don't hang me out to dry on anything. I remember Andy, you know, definitely saying, hey, just let me know what's going on, I'll back, you know, and all of them said the yeah. same thing. Let me know what's going on, and uh, I just got to stay ahead of things. So from a political point of view, I need to know what's going on. And, uh, you know, there were budgetary, you know, from a budgetary point of view, it's a different story. When they tell you, you know, you got to cut so much out of your budget, that's not a political, you know, that's kind of government. And you have to work around that and figure out how to do it. That's part of the job we do, you know, is figuring out how to, do more with less or whatever else. But um, from a political point of view, no. The legislature, and what we always did, because the big, the big sticking point with the legislature early on, getting back to teen pregnancy was, you know, our family planning budget, you know. And so I would always come in, I would be hounding the state health department for the data on last year's teen pregnancy rates, because I knew they were going like this. Mm -hmm. And each year I would come in, and when we talked about the family planning budget, I would show the slide and show how things were going, you know, especially the abortions going on. And they realized we're doing the right, you know, we're 
doing the job. And that's what they wanted. And, and so you have to know how to talk to people about what they're most passionate about and make sure they understand you're addressing these issues. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Dr. Spin. Dr. Spin, I've heard that term used about you <laughs> up at uh, Chautauqua. First of all, you're making a mistake in the title. It's the doctor of spin. Oh, okay. okay? And <laughs> it, it's not spin meaning BS, okay? It's spin on a spin bike. So Thank I, you for the correction. Okay. I said, well, you need to be corrected sometimes, young, my, young well, fellow. My wife's here. She'll I know. Well, of course she's here, and she knows very well. But basically, <laughs> um, I started spinning which is indoor, indoor bicycling. Uh, a number of years ago at Turner, I had a spin bike at home, you know, or my bike up on a trainer. But it's nice, it's a group of people, you get together like two days a week or something, and it becomes almost a community. I mean, everybody, where, why weren't you here last week? Where were, you know, and, and you just, and the instructor left. And the folks at Turner said, do you wanna do it? So I took a course on teaching spin, which is no big deal, you know. And so I've been doing it for, I don't know how many years now, maybe eight or 10 years. And until COVID, the room was always full. Uh, 14, 16 people, the windows would fog up. And people are yakking in the corners. You can't shut them, some of them you can't, they, they'll just talk no matter what you're doing, you know. And you try to kill them in there and they're still talking and others are, you know, complaining, you know. And, and, and but, um, the numbers have come down a, a fair amount, but still a dedicated group shows up Tuesday, Thursday uh, at 6, 30, 6 45 in the morning for an hour, and we just work really hard. And uh, this is a group that really likes to, to, to spin. And uh, everybody comes for a different reason and the different ages, but um, they, they want to get a workout early in the morning. And it's, uh, you're not pounding, you're on a bike, you know, and it's, it's hard, I mean, it's not hard in a sense, it's after a while you do it. Um, right now, I've been bringing this, they don't know, but I've been, I'm training for this triathlon, so I have a coach, and she sends me stuff in email, and these workouts are not for the faint of heart. I bring them and I do it for the, <laughs> and they love it, they just love it. And so, um, the summertime, we get folks, and I got a very funny story about this, we, we get folks from Chautauqua who come, and you know, some show up for one and they don't want any more of it, others show up. Well, my son-in-law, who is a, a competitive cyclist in Denver, um, we have a blackboard, it's an old classroom. On the blackboard are the records of what gear, how many miles in an hour, okay? And he holds all the records because he cycles with the pros, you know, and everything else. Well, this past summer, this lady comes in and she's tall. I mean, this lady was hmm, six foot seven maybe. I mean, she was tall, very tall lady. She comes in with her own shoes and her own pedals, takes the pedals off the bike, puts her own pedal, hey, hey, do whatever you want, I don't care. And um, she's working pretty hard. Thursday, and, and all the records are behind her. And the records go gear 12, 13, 14. And she says, I'm gonna, do gear 15, okay, you know? And we watch and she in 30 minutes sets a new record for gear 15. I mean, it, totally amazing. And I'm looking and I say, you gotta put your name on the board. There, she puts her name on the board. I look her up, US Olympic rowing team, 2004, <laughs> 2008. Yeah, no pain threshold. This woman could suffer I mean, you know, the suffer meter's gone. It, it's broken. She just could suffer for, I mean, you're talking to get that amount of mileage in in that time, you have to be able to tolerate just unbearable pain, which the rowers all learn how yeah, to do. Yeah. You row till you puke is what they do, basically, you know. Anyway, that's fascinating. But most of the people who come are just, you know, they, they have, and then they're the talkers. I can't, two of them, I can't stop talking. They just talk, and, but they're great. They, they stay with it and they cycle, but they can talk, you know. So all of this, you, you, you've got, I mean, a resume a mile long, and, but I would like to just end up with sort of a kind of reflection, kind of a Dr. Yeah. Burke reflection on, you've had many years, 
40 mm. years of pri private practice, mm. 40 years of being 50. involved. 50, 50 years, years 50 since years I graduated, practice. which doesn't make any sense because okay. I'm going to ask you a question before you ask me the question. How old are you in your head? How old what? How old are you inside your head? Oh, about 60. That, you, you're 20, pr probably 20 years younger than, than your stated age. And the people who are busy and whatever else, it's a study that's been done, they're all like living, they're in their head, they're, so I'm 38 years old in my head. My God. I, I, I don't know why, but that's where I am. I'm stuck there. Maybe 40, I'll give myself 40. Yeah. But anyway, go ahead, ask your question. No, 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 just kind of a reflection. Mm -hmm. You know, you've, you've had this extensive public career, extensive mm -hmm. even private practice, but you know, as you've seen, sort of a, maybe it's a Dr. Burke legacy question. You know, you, you've done so much. Uh, and yet Chautauqua County has been the beneficiary of so much. Do you kind of ever reflect on that? Yeah, a little bit. Recently, I have. I, I've, because I want to know what I'm going to do when I grow up, to be honest. I haven't figured out what I'm going to do my next, you know, at a certain point, I, I go into the office and seeing patients and everything. It's fun. I enjoy chatting with people. And, and actually, having now stopped being a managing partner, and I'm kind of just a working stiff, so to speak. I, I, I really enjoy it more because I, I have much more time. I, I interact more. But I keep thinking, well, what's your next? Travel, for me, is probably not a, I, I lived in Africa. I worked in Thailand uh, during the Khmer Rouge business in refugee camps. I've traveled in Europe a fair amount when I was in college. So, you know, the people say, oh, I'm going to go travel and everything. Yeah, there are places I like to see, but I, that's not what I think I want to do. I, I, writing, I've got things to write. I, so I've written two things. One was um, this photo, photojournalistic thing about photos of Africa. I really enjoyed looking at my old photos and putting, and, and I had written some verse, and I'd had this verse on some, about some of those photos for years. And I was playing with it, the words, you know, it's, they're short to try and describe that moment I captured that kid standing there, you know, with a baby on his back, looking at our vaccination team and captured him, you know. But, and then I have this book that I wrote for my family, uh, Tales My Patients Told Me. Fascinating stories. One was a Luftwaffe pilot in, in I met in Canada, you know, captured by the Russians, you know. And the guy who saved his life was a doctor who his father had taught in a German medical school and told him how they were going to torture him and he survived because of that. How does that happen? You know? And so these stories, you know, and so I think I, so my wife has decided uh, for, I think it was at Christmas, she gave me a, a gift for this year to go to the writers, uh, mm. you know, uh, three day writers um, uh, program in, in this year, so I'm going to do it just to improve my writing skills. And I've got my journal from Africa, which I can hardly, you know, understand what I wrote because it's, it's handwritten and I'm left-handed and that, you know, what that does. It's, but I've got three, you know, years of stuff that I wrote, reflections each day on what I was doing. So i thinking I'd like to do something with that. But what you're saying, what you're asking me is something different, is reflecting back on everything I've done. I don't know. I, I Well, each you've, made, you've made a difference. I mean, from the outside looking in Dr. Burke's legacy from uh, an observer like me and others, you've, tr you've made tremendous differences. You've made the hard decisions. You've stood up for what was right. Do you ever think about that? Yeah, but I, I don't see it as, I, I can't see it the way you're describing it. It's just something that I, I do, you know, uh, the philanthropic issues. I, I just see them as something that people should be doing. Um, it just, I, it's just things to do uh, and that they've worked out well or they've worked out so that um, other people have benefited. I feel really, I'm really happy about that, but I have trouble kind of putting the whole package together. You have like more to do when you're only at most 40 years old. I know, got, there's more to do. You've got miles to go. Miles to go before I sleep. Yeah. And miles and, to go before I sleep. And the doctor yes. of spin. 
Thank you very much. This has been terrific. Thank well, you. thank you. I, 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 I'm honored that you asked me to come and chat. I, I, and I feel badly my wife isn't here, but she's not feeling well, so, you know. Uh, she could watch it. Yes, yes. <laughs> so she's, she's watched it. You know, she's a poor, suffering wife. She's put up with, you know, me, uh, uh, you know, through all these years, some of these things, you know, have, uh, you know, we have four kids, and I, I, I my dad um, was a hardworking guy, but he didn't spend a lot of time with us, and I promised myself that I would spend my time with my kids. And uh, I still remember that first night that that story broke with Nushan. Yeah. And I'd been to all my kids' soccer games and everything. Even if it was the second half, they saw me there all the time. Couldn't do it. I couldn't go to, you know, couldn't go, you know. And she would she'd pick up after me, you know, and in situations like that where sometimes it's just so. Well, God bless Dr. Burke and God bless Jean Beliveau. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.